So while he was out there with the pigs, started to think about when they used to get the fresh bread out of the oven at home and all of the things he had taken for granted in his father's house. He came to himself. It's like he woke up one day and said, what in the world am I doing? He went to work and he smelled the pigs again for the first time. And, and I don't know if you've ever taken care of pigs. I have. I had some neighbors that had a little farm and they'd go on vacation and ask us to milk the cows and feed the pigs. And I didn't mind milking the cows so much, but the only word I can think of to describe pigs is to tell you that they're pigs. <laughs> and they smell awful. And they have really bad habits. And he one day went back to work and he thought, what in the world am I doing here? I'm a Jewish boy feeding pigs. He had an epiphany. He said, here, my father's got servants. He's got silos full of food. There is bread in my father's house. What am I doing here? And he came to his senses. That's kind of like sin will make you crazy. It's really. It's like Nebuchadnezzar. He was so full of pride, next thing he knew, he was out of his mind. And it took seven years for him to wake up and come to himself. And the first thing that came out of his mouth when he came to himself was, I praise the God in heaven. Because unless God is your priority, you're not thinking straight. Really. I mean, it's like Moses before the children of Israel entered the promised land, his closing sermon. He said, let me make it plain. Now, I put that in, but this is essentially what he said. He said, I'm setting before you this day life and good and blessing or death and evil and cursing. Which one do you want? Now, when you put it that way, what would you say you want? Do you want the life and good and blessing of being a Christian and in the church? In spite of the problems, it's a lot better than being out here where there's the death and the evil and the cursing. And that's why Jesus is wanting to bless you. He begins his sermon with beatitudes because he wants to bless his people. There's no happiness outside of the Father's house. And no one gave him anything. Finally, he came to his senses and he said, you know, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? They've got extra. They eat to the full. You know, whenever Jesus fed people, it says they had leftovers. He'd multiply the bread and there were leftovers. Elisha blessed the vessel of oil there in 2 Kings chapter 4, and the woman poured it, and it just was overflowing. God blesses with an abundance. And here he was wanting to eat the husks, the seed pods that the pigs were snorting through. They've got food to spare. Jesus is wanting to give you that bread of life. And I perish with hunger. You know, Jesus came into the world very simply, John 3, 16. He came into the world that you might not perish. And if you're not eating the bread of life, at least every week, you should be every day, you will surely perish. You're going to be starving. You know, in the last days, the Bible foretells there's going to be a famine in the land, and it's not a famine for bread or a thirst for water. This is Amos chapter 8, but for hearing the word of God. And I think you might even find a famine sometimes among religious people because there's so many counterfeit versions of the Word of God. And people will read one little verse and then they'll talk about the latest magazine articles. People need to really get into the, the grist of God's Word. There's an abundance of truth in the Father's house. And I perish with hunger. You know, it's interesting. When they woke up Jonah, when he was running from God, oh, by the way, going back to Jonah, my mind bounces around like that. It's because I use drugs when I'm young, so you just have to deal with it. <laughs> Going back to Jonah, you know, when he was asleep in the boat on the way to destruction, God sent a storm to save him. And the Lord sent a famine to save that boy. And maybe some of you who have been out of the church, you've been going through some trials and wondering, why is this happening? It could be because God loves you, and he's trying to get your attention. Sometimes it takes a crisis. It might be a crisis in your marriage. It could be a crisis with your health or work. And God is saying, hello, can I have your attention, please? 
And when the captain woke up Jonah, you know what he said? Arise, O sleeper, carest not that we perish. Jesus was once asleep in a boat during a storm, and they woke him up, and they asked Jesus the dumbest question in the world. They said, Master, carest not that we perish? Does Jesus care whether or not we perish? Why did he come into this world? That we might not perish. And if you got Jesus in your boat, you're going to make it, friends. So not perish with hunger. I will arise. God told Jonah, arise and go. Finally, he said, I will arise and go to my father. And I'll say to him, father, he's got a speech prepared. How can I walk back and talk to dad? After what I've done here, I basically was so rude, disrespectful, didn't honor him, asked for my inheritance early. Then I took it, and I'm coming back with nothing to show for it. He worked for years to get all that. You notice the boy earlier, he wanted his father, but he didn't want a relationship with his father. I'm sorry, he wanted his father's blessings. He wanted his father's resources, but he didn't want the father. Now, I think everybody here wants God's blessings. There are whole churches that are built around the reason that God exists is just to be a funnel of blessings for you. Really, we exist for the glory of God. And the secret of life is not ultimately your happiness, it's your holiness. But your holiness will lead to happiness. And by the way, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. And the most important way for you to be blessed is to give your heart, then you receive the greatest blessing. That's the only way you can ever be happy, is by giving your life to Jesus. I'm going to arise and go to my father's house. He's thinking about how do I ever face him again after what I've done. You know, it wasn't until years later I was talking to my dad that I realized, you know, I had an older brother that was sick, and I was the, the young, healthy one. Um, my brother used to always say, life is not fair. My brother had cystic fibrosis. He said, you know, Doug, he said, here, I'm smart, but I'm sick, and you're healthy, but you're stupid. These brothers can talk that way to each other. <laughs> and when here I was the, the baby of the family, and, and I ran away at 15, and I never called my dad sometimes for months. And all he knew was I was living up in the mountains by myself. And I had no idea how hurt he was about that until sometimes, it's like 20 years later, I was talking to him, and this, this flurry of emotion came out. He said, all those all those months when we didn't know where you were, we didn't know whether you were dead or alive. And it finally dawned on me, boy, you know, now I'm a parent, I get an idea of how much that really hurt him. So this boy's heading home, and he's thinking, how can I ever face him again after what I've done? I'll go, and here's what I'll say. I have to confess. Father, I have sinned. By the way, you must confess when you come to God. Don't be afraid. Does he know anyway? Well, you'll feel better if you confess. He already knows. You're not going to shock him. <laughs> One of the first things you do is you repent. Tell God you're sorry, and you confess your sins. And as soon as you do that, you give him permission to release the power of his spirit in your life. And I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Who is worthy to be a son of God? That's why John tells us in... 1 John chapter 3, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. He can't even explain it. He says, just behold it, that we should be called sons of God. He's willing to give us a new name and bring us back into the family with the full stature of being sons. I'm not worthy. What is it that makes us worthy? It's only God's grace and his son, Jesus Christ. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, that is the attitude that we all need when we come back to the Father. Lord, I'm willing to come and serve you. I don't deserve to be your son. I'll be happy as your servant. And so he begins his journey home. He arose, and he came to his father. And it took a long way for him to plod. Probably didn't have any spare food in his backpack. Had to beg along the way. But he was shocked as he started getting near the family farm. While he was still a great way off, 
coming over the hill and the silhouette of his form is seen there hobbling along. As soon as the father spies him, he runs to meet him. He doesn't make him wait. You know, some of us, I think, we'd say, well, I told you you'd become dragging back. <laughs> Arms folded on the front porch, tapping our foot, looking the other way. <laughs> say, all right, was I right or was I right? That's what I probably do. <laughs> we, we've got that speech, I told you so. <laughs> or we'd make that, uh, make that statement in front of the spouse and say, didn't I tell you that he'd... <laughs> but not this father. He can't even wait for him to come home. So that he won't be left with any doubt of his acceptance, he arises and he runs to meet him. You know, there's a promise in the Bible. It says, you draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Our Father in heaven is so anxious for us to be saved. That means that as soon as we take some steps and we begin to move towards God, and he sees us making an effort to come to him, what does he do? He will run to meet us. Now, how come that father didn't send out bounty hunters to find the son when he first went away from home? Can you force someone to love you? And you know, our Father in Heaven can't force you to come home. He's not going to force you to come back to church. You've got to come to your senses and take those first steps and say, you know, I believe this is where I'm supposed to be. There's bread in my Father's house. And as you come, as soon as you make that first step, you draw near to God, He will draw near to you. You know, there are a number of scriptures that uh, are on that, uh, that line. First you come, and you come confessing. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you've transgressed against the Lord your God, that you've not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. He's pleading with Israel here. He says, return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. You know, not only here in Jeremiah, but in the book of Hosea, God not only compares it to a father and a son, but it's, he compares it to a husband and a wife. And he says, you know, even though you've been unfaithful, even though you've gone after other gods, I love you so much that I'll still take you back. And that takes a lot of love because I'll tell you, you know, one of the most difficult uh, things to deal with is when there's been infidelity in a marriage. Some people fold their arms and stomp their foot and say, that's the end. But God's love is so incredible that he says to his people, even after you have spurned my love with someone else, return to me. He says to his people, return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I'm married to you. And again in verse 22, return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. You know, uh, I think about the story in the Bible where Jacob ran away from home. He left the father's house, and then he comes home. But it's sort of different because Jacob leaves poor and he comes back rich. This boy leaves rich and he comes back poor. And the Lord still receives him. You know, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, a matter of fact, I don't know if I've ever read it without having my eyes puddle up, is the story of Joseph. It occupies the latter half of Genesis. And Jacob's supreme love was for Rachel. And the first son of Rachel, she couldn't have a boy for years, was this promised boy named Joseph. And he was just lavished so much love on Joseph. He loved him more than any father should probably love a son. In front of all his brothers, he gives him this robe of many colors and just indulges him. And then his brothers are jealous. So they sell Joseph. Father thinks he's been killed. Carried off as a slave to another land, ends up not only being a slave, but being a prisoner. And you can read the whole story there of Joseph and his trials, and all of a sudden how he goes from the prison to the palace in one day. And then finally he reveals himself to his brothers, that he's alive. And you know what he finally says, weeping? He says, is my father alive? His heart was breaking to be reunited with his father. And he sends an army along with his brothers back, and he says, bring my father. And then you've got that picture in the Bible, finally, when Jacob realizes his son is alive. And 
You can just picture Joseph getting out of his gilded chariot and Jacob getting...